Coming up on One Central Florida. Civil War history comes alive at the Pelissier Creek Raid reenactment. I like to almost put it like a sporting event. Because, you know, you get excited, you know, your, your blood gets up. Then, people come from all over the world to join an Orlando surgeon for a swim across Lake Kane. I love having people come out, and uh, if they can experience some of the joy, too, that I get to have here, it's a better world. Plus, mountain biking in Central Florida? Yes. And this area's unique terrain attracts bikers from all over the United States. And meet the Winter Springs woman who made it her mission to save parrots from abuse and neglect. All that and more on this edition of One Central Florida. Florida was the site of just a few small Civil War battles and skirmishes. There is no historical record of an engagement near Pelissier Creek in Flagler County. But locals tell the story of Union troops stationed in St. Augustine who ventured south on a foraging expedition. They're looking for supplies, livestock, fruits and vegetables, things that they can support their army with. And they're going to come into contact with some Confederate soldiers that are maybe guarding a road, the main road out of St. Augustine. And they're going to exchange some fire. Ready! Mark Judd is a captain of the 15th Alabama Company B, a Civil War reenactment unit who is part of the annual Pelissier Creek Raid reenactment at the Florida Agriculture Museum near Palm Coast, Florida. A lot of people get into reenacting for different reasons. Some people get in it because they enjoy camping. That's what we're doing is we are camping. I got into it for the historical aspect of it. I liked to get into the mindset of what it was like for the soldiers. And then I enjoy the camaraderie. You know, it's like I have another family that's out here that uh, goes to reenacting. My brother also reenacts and he's here this weekend. So it's a good reason to get together and then portray the battle and honor our veterans both on the north and the south. I'm portraying Johnny Ulysses S. Grant, and one of the reasons that I decided to portray him was because, in my opinion, he's one of the greatest average Americans that ever lived. He wasn't stuck up, he wasn't, you know, on a pedestal above his men. I'm actually a revenue cutter captain, which is uh, the forerunner to the Coast Guard. They were active along the coast here, doing raiding parties inland. They supported the Navy. The reenactors show up, they start coming in Wednesday, Thursday night and start setting up their tents and getting all ready and they completely go into their character and it's just wonderful. The guests get to come through and look at all the tents that are set up and talk with them. Together, one. It's one of my days with my girls and we were here last year, they had a good time. We decided to come back again this year. It gives them an opportunity to learn about Civil War and history. Visitors to the reenactment can also get a glimpse of everyday life during the war. I'm out here today with my daughters, Dixie and Belle, and we are representing civilian life. There were very few ladies that were actually out with the troops in the, in the camps, so we're more representing what the average person was doing at home. I love to teach and sharing with children and ladies what their roles would have been during that time period. But the main draw of a Civil War reenactment is the battle. This morning we'll wake up to uh, Reveille at 7 o'clock. That tells you get up, start cooking breakfast. After breakfast, guys will make sure that they have cartridges loaded, that they have their caps, all their equipment squared away, fill their canteens. A lot of the times during reenactments, and especially the larger reenactments, we'll have a drill session where we'll fall together and we'll practice our manual of arms. One, two, one, 
Two, one. We'll have an officer's call at 10 o'clock this morning. The officers from both sides will meet. We'll go over the battle plan. The union's going to start. And if they want the call to muster brings all the troops into line for a march to the battlefield. 15th Alabama, first call. The gray to the right, the blue to the left. Both sides present their colors and the battle begins. I like to almost put it like a sporting event because, you know, you get excited, you know, your, your blood gets up. Sometimes you'll get into the moment. And as a historian, you're like, I can't believe that the men fought this way. You stood shoulder to shoulder and you advanced across open ground towards the enemy. Of course, every battle includes casualties. Part of the way that we determine if you're going to die or how we refer to it as take a hit is first we know who's going to win or lose that day. So the officers are going to say, well, in this sort of scenario, we would be pushing forward, we would be under fire. We're going to need to take some casualties, take a few hits. It looked like we had a pretty good fight, good reenactment. The Union ended up being victorious and drove us from the field. We're going to do a salute now for the crowd. While the details of a skirmish at Pelissier Creek are unknown, this reenactment tries to do more than just recreate a small Civil War encounter. 15th Alabama, all present or accounted for, sir. It's not about North and South. It's not about Yankee and Confederate. It's about bringing history back to life, showing the public what it was like for the soldier on the field and what the hell that was that they went through for their beliefs, no matter what the beliefs were. We're a part of history here at Florida, so we want to make sure that history stays alive and it's still living and, and breathing here in Florida. Is going to be in the John Lucky Meisenheimer is one of Orlando's prominent dermatologists well known for surgically treating skin cancer. But he's best known for his achievements far from the operating room, like swimming. Since 1989, Lucky's morning routine has included a swim across Lake Kane. When I found this property 26 years ago, it was on a you know 80 acre lake. There wasn't a lot of public access, so there weren't boats. It was just the perfect swimming lake, spring fed. And I'm going, this is where I was meant to be. And I started swimming the lake on my own. I started inviting a few friends. And first it was just every once in a while at parties. And then it became three day a week. And then it went to five days a week. And then we added Saturday. So we've logged a lot of crossings in over the last uh, 26 years. It's early Saturday morning in West Orlando. And as the sun starts to rise over Lake Kane, Lucky's Lake Swim is a popular area attraction. It's an open invitation to anyone who wants to come swim with Lucky. Just after dawn, neighbors, friends, and first timers start rolling in for the 7.45 a.m. swim. The most people we've had is 478 swimmers. I don't know where everybody parked. That's the most by far. The average is 100 or so swimmers, and it's not just average folks who show up. Three-time Olympic gold medalist Rowdy Gaines has been there more than a few times. First of all, the swim itself is legendary. If you're anywhere from these parts, you know Lucky's Lake Swim. In fact, I've been here a million times, but every time I always forget what exit to take. And so I push Siri and I go, Siri, where's Lucky's Lake Swim? And she instantly gave me the address. That's how legendary, even Siri knows where it is. It's just evolved over the years, and it's just neat to see what can happen when the kind of the community gets together and says, hey, we've got something really good here and special. But it's now ranked one of the top 100 swims in the United States by the World Open Water Swimming Association, which is very neat because there's over 4,000 open water swims now. 
it's just a, a great community spirit here. A lot of the people on the lake that live here have done the swim and people from all over the world. We've got over 60 countries represented now. You know, the old field of dreams, they say build it and they will come. Well, this is the, the, the lake of dreams, if you will, because uh, we've got something really special here. Lucky figures he's made this lake crossing about 20,000 times. And he has a growing list of longtime friends who have joined him. I've done it since 2009, and I have had almost 360, I'm approaching 400 crossings. I just enjoy the diversity of the crowd and the excitement and just kind of the craziness of it all. Believe it or not, uh, swimming is my social activity. Uh, which is a little strange because I know you jump in a lake and you kind of swim off by yourself, but it's, you know, the people beforehand, the people afterwards. Lucky has got such a community of people that come out here and swim. I'm Gene Augustine. I'm 84 years old. I've got about 1,400 crossings. The most amazing thing about it is that two and a half years ago, I came down with pancreatic cancer. I've been cured of the cancer and I'm recovering from the surgery and doing well. I swim almost every day. It's one of the best exercises I can do. Lucky places no restrictions on who can join in the fun. Doc, uh, that's his name, Doc, and Doc is a duck, and he is at his five or six hundredth crossing, and he does swim the lake with us too as well, and, and he lives with us. So what can you say? I've got a pet duck that likes to swim the lake. Lucky's Lake Swim has become such a local institution. It even has its own swag. Here's your patch, your bumper sticker, your login sheet. We kind of encourage people to come out for fitness and community, but we give little milestone awards. So when you reach 25, you get a certain color, uh, you get a white cap. When you reach 150, you get a yellow cap and so on and so forth, up till 1,000 where you get the, the gold cap. We've got at least 15 people that are in the 1,000 or plus more uh, crossing range. So these people have been swimming with me for years and years and years. I say this is the fountain of youth. Many swimmers record their participation by signing the wall. The wall itself is an amazing read. We'll have people from other countries, we'll have Olympians, English Channel swimmers, and now it's like we've run out of wall, we've run out of ceiling, we're around the side of the house and there's just thousands and thousands and thousands of names. And every time you think, well, how many more swimmers could possibly come out? We always have new swimmers, always. But Meisenheimer isn't just a well-known physician and host of Lucky's Lake Swim. Internationally, I'm better known for my yo-yo collection. I have the Guinness World Records largest yo-yo collection. I wrote the book on yo-yos, and the book is actually in the Smithsonian Institution. Most people consider me the authority on the history of the yo-yo, and I'm still fascinated by the subject. For Dr. John Lucky Meisenheimer, it's all part of his grand plan. I love having people come out and uh, if they can experience some of the joy too that I get to have here, uh, more power to it, it's a better world. And, and I really think the world would be a better place if it was like the Lake Swim because here it doesn't matter what the color of your skin is, what your religion is, whether you're wealthy or whether you're poor. Everybody's welcome here, everybody gets along and would the world be a better place if we were all like that. Don't get no better than this. Coming up on One Central Florida, ride the trails near Ocala that challenge riders from across the country. Also, these beautiful birds sometimes need rescue, and this woman has the heart for it. We love Oviedo because of the, the small town atmosphere. The hardware store and the, uh, the townhouse restaurant here brings back memories of a uh, small town where I grew up in. Oviedo is so calm. It's beautiful and it's uh, it's very friendly. Everybody here is you know really relaxed and it's a it's a nice corner of Orlando as I like to say. A unique aspect of Oviedo is the fact that we have wild chickens running around and it's the icon of the city and we love them. It is just such a, a warm community. It's a safe community. There is so much to do just for for families and for young professionals and we're located in a great part of the state. Boulders, hills, mountains, in central Florida? It may be hard to believe, but mountain biking is big in an area known as the Cross Florida Greenway near Ocala. 
Jared Hopkins is an avid mountain biker and president of the Ocala Mountain Bike Association. You always get the comments from people up north saying, you know, they don't have mountains in Florida, how can you go mountain biking? But I have people that come down from all over the country and we take them on these, some of these trails and they're very surprised at how difficult they can be. Of course, these are not actual mountains. They are changes in elevation created by excavations for the Cross Florida Barge Canal a massive civil works project that was begun in 1964 to create a route for commerce through Central Florida. Only about one third of it was completed before construction was halted in 1971 because of environmental concerns. The canal's right of way was later turned into a protected greenway. They did big diggings, so we've got 40 and 50 foot high berms, and then we've got a couple of lime rock quarries here that have extreme terrain where the rock was dug out and is really well tailored to having extreme type mountain biking and high level difficulty trails. It's the closest thing that you're going to get to being out in the mountains. A lot of it's very similar and it's a lot of fun and it's very thrilling. Charlie Bailey is a competitive mountain biker who has also ridden in the North Carolina mountains. Some of the rocks here you have to be a little careful going over. You just have to really plan out where and how you're going to ride over it ahead of time. Just keep your head looking down the trail. Always see what's in front of you. Oh, yeah, I had plenty of wipeouts. As I started getting better, I started realizing how much fun it was and how much of a better rider I was becoming. 15-year-old Emily House has been mountain biking for three years. It's, it's very physically challenging. You have to have the legs to do it. You have to have a lot of core strength to get up some of the harder things because you've got to lift, physically lift up your bike. You get dirty, you get sweaty, and you get bloody. It's not going to happen once, it's not going to happen twice, it's going to happen a lot of times. The Greenway includes the Santos Trails, which draws riders from all over the world. Estimates are that mountain biking contributes $15 million to the local economy. The trails we have here are definitely the most popular in the state and it's ranked on mountain biking websites as top 10 in the, in the southeast. And it's actually a top 10 in the U.S. for a, a vacation destination because of the mild weather in the winter so people come down from up north when it, they can't ride up there and they come down here for a week of vacation and maybe do some riding. You don't have to be an expert to bike the Santos Trails. Definitely a helmet is the most important thing to have when you're mountain biking to protect your head if you do crash. You know, most mountain bikes will have suspension, especially a, a front suspension fork. So when you ride over a root or rock, it's a little more comfortable. It also helps keep your tire on the ground instead of bouncing off the ground. The bikes are all a preference. I recommend getting something from a bike shop. They're a lot more durable and you can upgrade them. The trails are graded, so you can start out easy. Here we have three basic levels. Any yellow trail is the easiest trail. The medium trails are the blue mark trails, a little more technical, but not as hard as our red level trails, which are the most difficult. You can come out and start on the easy ones so you feel comfortable there. Move your way up to the blue trails and then on to the red as you progress in your skills. A lot of people will come out and ride on their own, depending on how their work schedule is but then a lot of people like to get together with others and ride the same skill level and you kind of learn from each other. I've met some really cool people. It's almost an extended family. I love mountain biking here because it's gorgeous. I love being outside. Hopkins lives nearby, so he rides the Santos trails often. It's a good way to get away from work or stresses of life and you're focused on the trail, so you're not worried so much about the outside things. You get into nature and you hear the, the birds and everything, it just kind of takes you away from all of that and you focus on what you enjoy doing.
parrots all have different personalities. They all have different strengths. They all have different weaknesses. You know how you say it's like there's a person in that body? That's how it is with parrots. You're a good girl. I was at a friend's house visiting for the weekend and she had two parakeets on her sunroom. And every morning we'd sit and have breakfast and it just sounded so calming and sweet. And I said to my husband, I want a couple parakeets for the back porch. I purchased a pineapple conure, and that's how I decided to get a bird. Patricia's love for birds has only grown since her first parrot. She experienced an so even bigger life to, change when she went to purchase a bird uh, cage from an online ad. Uh, the woman took me around the back of her house and opened a door to a very dark room. There were spider webs, roaches, and a rat had run across the room. There were no lights, no windows. I noticed there was movement in the cages, and I said, are you kidding me, are there birds in these cages? And she said, oh yeah, they're for sale too, $2,800 for all of them. One of the birds was dead, and there was a rat on the floor next to her, and I told her that I would pay her for the cages I needed and that she was gonna surrender the birds to me. That experience led Patricia and her husband to found Patty's Parrot Palace, a nonprofit sanctuary providing rescue, rehabilitation, and permanent placement for parrots. So this is what takes 10 to 12 hours of our day. This is just one room out of three that we have the parrots located in. We foster the birds here at our home. We have approximately 60 birds and they're all of different parrot species. This is Treasure. She was born uh, with a deformed foot. She's missing a toe on her right foot. Um, I saw the possibility of her going through a breeding facility and so I took her from the breeder and she came here first uh, and then Neo joined us later and Neo came from a gentleman who uh, was a pilot and when the economy got back he had to go back to work so Neo came separately and they chose each other they're in a double cage and they'll go into flight together it's a lot of work I'm very grateful that we have a awesome group of volunteers from the age of 16 to 72. Duties include helping with the cages, changing paper, giving them fresh water, feeding them. Everyone loves the feeding part. And then they get baths on Saturday, all 60 of them. Come on, Popeye. Ooh, look at Popeye. Birds come to Patricia's come on, for different reasons. Some have been ignored and mistreated. Some have been surrendered when their owners can no longer care for them. People think, oh, it'll talk to me. I can put it in a cage and walk away. Well, they will talk to you, and you can put them in a cage. But if you're not giving them the attention they need, you're going to have some self-mutilating, the screaming, and biting. So this is what Sam did to herself from stress. When we picked her up, she actually did not have this layer of feathers. Um, she will never get this back because she's destroyed even the follicle. Patricia also teaches would-be parrot owners what it takes to care for their pet. Every day after school. Public events are a great place to educate. Well, a lot of the times the kids will be drawn to the parrot, but we can educate the parents on the responsibility. This is the most recent site plan. Okay, well, you know, I've cleared. Looking to the future, the Coils want to build an expanded sanctuary to help accomplish their mission. Our plans now are to develop flight aviaries for the birds, let them go back to flight, which we believe is one of their biggest desires, and to let the birds live their life out in the sanctuary. Come here, Papa. Hi. I know this sounds kind of strange, but I understand them. They're, they're like children, and I love working with children, and, and I love animals, um, but they, they're very bright, and I see them for more than what people see them for. And he does the, the French kiss. Huh, don't you? 